borders is the ink in which our global politics are drawn today. But what's wrong? The, 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 the good type of border would be between Massachusetts and New Hampshire. You can have different laws, but there is no need to, to have uh, this mechanism of injury. The, the changing design, all of it has done is just produce different types of trauma. It has not deterred people. It has either pushed them to go around or over. It has increased the revenues of organized crime in Mexico because they are controlling these more sophisticated routes of crossing. So it is just counterproductive. Now I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker. Yeva Yusiante is Assistant Professor of Anthropology and Social Studies at Harvard University. She has written extensively about borders, security, and violence in both academic journals and popular press. Her latest book is Threshold, Emergency Responders on the U.S.-Mexico Border. In their starred review, publisher, Publishers Weekly praises that Threshold explores the sister towns bisected by the border from many angles. It is an illuminating and poignant exploration of a place and situation that are little discussed yet have significant implications for larger political discourse. Please join me in welcoming Yeva Yusiante. Some of you have supported my pursuits, very strange pursuits for many years, and uh, without your help and your encouragement, I would have never embarked on this journey that resulted in the publication of this book. So it's really an honor to have you here. We didn't plan it this way, but today marks an important anniversary. On November 9, 29 years ago, the Berlin Wall fell. But it appears that uh, history's lessons are short-lived and now walls are popular again. Just earlier this week, some of the troops that the government has uh, deployed to the U.S.-Mexico border started arriving in Texas and Arizona, um, and they brought with them the uh, coils of razor wire that they have now unspooled on, uh, on the existing barriers on top of the um, on top of the existing barriers at the ports of entry along the border. So in light of everything that is happening in this country um, right now, it is very difficult for me to take this book outside of the immediate context and to talk about it um, without reference to the current political moment, uh, fear mongering and criminalization of migration uh, especially. But the stories the book tells and the arguments it makes go way beyond the here and now. Um, it, is, it shows what walls and fences do to human bodies, to communities, to the environment, and uh, how instead of protecting they harm, how they injure and kill, and um, how this has been going on for decades in the Southwest, but really for centuries around the world. So while doing ethnographic research, uh, I was also volunteering as an emergency medical technician and EMT um, and paramedic on both sides of the border in southern Arizona and in northern Mexico. And I saw how the barrier that some call a wall and others call a fence has been mutilating um, the bodies of those who try to scale it. So women and men who fall off the present around 20 feet tall barrier, fracture their uh, legs and injure the spinal cord. Some have died from head trauma. In towns along the southern Arizona's uh, fringe, ambulances are called to help injured border crossers with such frequency that the emergency responders who work there call the, the cement ledge abutting the wall uh, the ankle alley. And from uh, EMTs to emergency room doctors, for medical professionals, it is very clear that the mechanism of injury depends on, uh, on the design of the barrier. The previous uh, fences in the area, so in the 1990s and early 2000s, were made of this corrugated sheet panels that the US military used as landing mats for cargo aircraft during the Vietnam War. And the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers noticed that the very sharp edges of these landing pads were ripping the tires of uh, the helicopters and the aircraft. So they had to replace them. But once they were put on the border, they started causing um, 
primarily finger amputations to people who are trying to scale the barrier. The wall is a key component of uh, tactical infrastructure, and that's a concept that Customs and Water Protection uses to refer to an assemblage of materials and technologies that regulate movement in the name of national security. In other words, this it's, it's a weapon that has been deployed on, um, on the front lines of the overlapping wars the government is waging in the borderlands, the war on crime, the war on drugs, the war on terror, and now the war on immigration. About one-third of the length of the U.S. border with Mexico, or roughly 650 out of 2,000 miles, have some form of fences. Uh, some of these are anti-vehicle barriers, others are pedestrian, bollard-style uh, fences. There is abundant evidence that they don't work, at least not what they are politically marketed for, and it has their ineffectiveness has nothing to do with their height. The size of border fences has actually doubled since the 1990s, but they have failed to stop uh, illegal drugs or deter unauthorized migrants um, because fortification doesn't address the root causes of these phenomena. What it does do, and what my book shows, is that walls have, uh, have been consistently successful as a mechanism of injury. But migrants are not uh, the only victims of border militarization. Uh, by focusing on uh, building barriers, federal authorities also um, ignore the harm that tactical infrastructure does to communities that are straddling the boundary or that are divided by it. Um, Arizona, for example, is downwind, downstream, uh, and uh, downhill from Sonora, Mexico. Uh, and wildfires and flash floods, um, toxic spills or air pollution spreads from one country to another without regard for political jurisdictions. Uh, understanding uh, this intertwinement, emergency services, with the help of EPA, uh, have developed by national partnerships, some of which are over a century old now. Sister cities have mutual aid agreements they in, in, sh to share resources if there is an emergency on one side or the other, including shuttling, shuttling water across the border. The U.S. Forest Service and the Mexican National Forestry Commission fight wildland fires together if they occur within a 10-mile radius on either side of the international boundary. It all makes sense because in these uh, communities, not only the natural environment, but also um, logistical infrastructure is intermeshed, both on the surface and underground. Um, there are roads and uh, train tracks and pipelines, uh, some of them carrying raw sewage that cross the border perpendicularly. Uh, there are talks of creating binational um, electric grid but these efforts are often undermined by more security-oriented branches of the state bureaucracy, especially the Department of Homeland Security, that ignore the human, social, and ecological costs of border fortification. So this book looks at the situation through the perspective of emergency responders, firefighters who are trained either as EMTs or paramedics, and who are struggling with these, uh, struggling to reconcile these um, differences between their ethical and their legal mandates as they are providing care and rescuing people injured by the very state whose insignia they are wearing on the uniforms. Emergency services espouses an ethics of anti-politics, the star um, of life on their, on on our uniforms uh, signals like, like the Red Cross on medical tents and war zones, signals uh, impartiality and conflict um, and service to humanity. But uh, so, so, so when, when uh, we try to stop the bleeding before a person loses too much blood without asking questions of who and why injured that person. However, there is a point, a threshold perhaps, when the repeated and the patterned injuries that emergency responders see beg those larger questions of why is this really happening. So I will read um, a few excerpts from the book 
Some of them will show you what it means like to be, what, what it feels, what it looks like to be an emergency responder now uh, on the border, and then uh, a short section from the epilogue that gives some broader reflections. And then we can do questions. Fence jumpers, May 18, 2015. The call came in around 10.45 a.m. Over the loudspeaker, the city's 911 dispatcher instructed Medic 1 and Engine 3 to respond to the area west of the Mariposa port of entry for a 30-year-old female with traumatic injuries from a fall. Lights and siren on, it took us only a few minutes to reach the scene of the emergency. Because of the rugged terrain near the border fence, La Linea de Visora, in this place, rescue vehicles couldn't get close to the patient. We left the engine parked on a hill and ran towards the wall. Lying supine on the strip of concrete that stretches parallel to the rusty metal fence was a young woman, whom I will call Araceli. She had climbed a ladder on the other side, but was unable to hold on to the structure and fell down from a height of approximately 24 feet. Araceli had bilateral open ankle fractures and complained of back pain. We were told that she had been lying there for two hours when a Border Patrol agent found her. Ay, mis piernas, she shouted, grimacing from the pain in her legs. The rescuers acted quickly. At the direction of J-Lo, an energetic bilingual paramedic, they removed her sneakers and cut off the bottom part of her jeans to expose the injuries. They cleaned Araceli's feet with normal saline and bandaged and splinted them using cardboard and tape. A cervical collar was put around her neck to protect her spine from further injury. Araceli was dehydrated, so J-Lo started an IV to give her fluids. Next, he had to ease her pain. I noticed him struggling to administer morphine while one of his hands was occupied with a saline bag, and I offered to hold the IV set. Quiero agua, Araceli repeated several times, imploring her rescuers to give her water. All the while, three Border Patrol agents clad in green stood and watched what the firefighters were doing. They had Anglo last names printed on the uniforms, and it wasn't clear whether they could understand the conversation between the patient and the firefighters, which was in Spanish. Occasionally, the agents would peer through the fence to the other side, perhaps checking for threats. Rocking, the practice of pelting agents with stones or rocks to distract them from while smugglers snuck across, was less frequent since the new fence was built, with gaps that allow agents to see into Mexico. But it was not outside the realm of possibility. Several firefighters now helping the injured woman have experienced what it was like to care for the patient with rocks aiming at them flying over the fence. But that didn't happen this time. They secured Araceli to the backboard, put her onto the gurney, and pushed her into the back of the ambulance. The mechanism of injury qualified the patient for trauma alert, which meant that she had to be flown directly to the University Medical Center in Tucson, the only level one trauma facility in the region. The fire department could have asked the helicopter to land at the scene, but Holy Cross Hospital was close, so they decided to take Araceli to the, to the helipad by ambulance. Se trajeron mis zapatos, she asked. Did anyone bring her shoes? She had broken both of her legs, and months would go by before she was able to walk again. But she was thinking about her shoes, a weapon of the weak which migrants use against the state and its restrictive policies, and against the treacherous desert ready to obliterate them. To walk under the light of the moon, to run from bandits who want to rob and hurt them, and from the border patrol agents who want to capture them and send them back to start all over again. Without her shoes, she doesn't stand another chance. Before we left the scene, one of the firefighters collected Araceli's blood-stained shoes and put them into a red biohazard bag. On our way back to the station, I asked Chewie whether it was his first call to the border fence. It's been about two months since he started working for Nogales Fire. No, the rookie said. On my second shift, I had three and a structure fire. June 20, 2015. The dispatch announced over the loudspeakers, 1500 La Quinta Road, Border Patrol Station. Female having a seizure, Medic 2, Engine 2 respond. We headed south, then west under the I-19 overpass and south again, upslope toward the commercial port of entry. Before reaching customs, we made a right turn and after a short drive up the hill, we were facing the gate to the fenced-in grounds of the Nogales Border Patrol Station. 
The gate was closed and a sign with a CBP logo declared. Warning, no trespassing, restricted area, keep out, authorized personnel only. A border patrol vehicle approached us in less than a minute. The agent got out and opened the gate. We went inside, the ambulance first, then the engine, passing a large parking lot with an impressive fleet of Ford excursions and other types of trucks, all white with green stripes. Many of them had cages mounted on the bed. That's where they carry detained UDAs, undocumented aliens, which they picked up along the border fence downtown or out in the canyons. On the radio, UDAs sounded more technical and discreet than illegals. The cages into which they were shoved were not tall, and during those rough rides to the station, even when seated, UDAs would bang their heads on the roof. As soon as we approached the entrance to the facility, we got off and hurried down the hallway, which ended at locked metal doors. Last year, this large warehouse was full. Steel fenced cages with rolls of barbed wire on top were full of children. Kids were cramped inside como animalitos, Bojo told me, like little animals. The Nogales Fire Department sent an ambulance up here several times a day, making rounds between the Border Patrol Station and the Holy Cross Hospital. Children had asthma attacks, they fainted, one had chicken pox, another had 104 fever. A 17-year-old pregnant girl was taken to the hospital for labor pains. If that doesn't break your heart, nothing will, Billy Bob told me about those runs. I'm a cowboy type of guy. I've seen cattle being herded like that. Put all your bulls over here, put all your cows over there. And here it's put all the Guatemalans over here, put all the Hondurans over there. Thousands of unaccompanied minors detained along the U.S.-Mexico border, many of them in South Texas, were brought to Nogales for processing. In June 2014, the station housed around 900 children, just a handful of over 68,000 minors apprehended along the southwest border that fiscal year. There is a lot of desperate people in this world, enough to go home and just kiss your kids and say, thank God I was born on the side of the border, Billy Bob said. As sad as it sounds, he added. I had been to the Border Patrol station before. My first call was, quote, in reference to a 17-year-old male juvenile with fever, unquote. That time, Captain Lopez told me to ride in the ambulance with Scott and Frank. Once inside the building, we passed shelves lined with water jugs, supplies and belongings taken from the detainees, all placed inside transparent plastic bags. On the right and on the left were cells with numbers. Some of them were full, others marked as empty. Several Border Patrol agents stood behind a counter in the main hall with monitors hanging above their heads, not unlike a check-in desk at an airport. There were several signs in Spanish warning that crossing the border is dangerous. No cruces el desierto was written on a red poster attached above the door to cell number one. Emphasis was put on the words muerte, death, and peligro, danger. Some adolescent boys pressed their faces against the dark glass of the cell, watching what was happening. On the opposite side of the hall, a cell with a sign that said female was occupied by young women and girls. The facility had no windows. It was hard to tell the time of day. Jose Luis was sitting on a bench outside of cell number one. He was wearing a white t-shirt with Cozumel, Mexico written on the front. Did he used to work there, serving American tourists? Has he been there on vacation with his family? Was the shirt a donation he picked up on one, at one of the shelters along the migrant trail during his trip to El Norte? Questions swirled in my head as I pictured the contrast between the tropical beach resort and his present surroundings. A representative of the Mexican consulate dressed in a black uniform told the paramedics that the boy had been complaining of fever. 99 degrees, according to the Border Patrol. Scott asked Frank to check it again with their own thermometer. It recorded 102. The agent at the counter told us that Jose Luis was apprehended around 7 o'clock in the morning after walking in the desert for 8 or 9 hours. He didn't drink uh, any fluids while he was walking, the agent relayed, but they gave him food and water at the station. When he talked to the boy, Scott needed help from Frank to translate for him. By a Frank, Jose Luis said that he had recently taken an aproxen pill, an anti-inflammatory drug used for reducing pain and fever, which he carried in a hidden pocket. A secret pocket? Asked one of the agents when he overheard the boy's confession, sounding surprised 
but non-judgmental. Frank took the rest of the bo boys' vital signs and ran an EKG. Jose Luis was slightly tachycardic, which was normal, a normal response to fever and dehydration. Scott asked the Border Patrol agents whether they wanted the boy to be taken to the hospital. One of them replied that if Jose Luis wanted to go, then he should go. But when Frank translated for the boy, Jose Luis said that he should be fine. No, no es necesario, he said. Scott then asked the agent whether the protocols allowed them to start IVs and got an affirmative answer. I would give him two bags of fluids, he said. How about fever meds, he then asked. The agent explained that the hospital, uh, that their protocols did not allow Border Patrol to administer medications to reduce fever, although the detainee could take a pill if he already had one with him. That's where those secret pockets become handy. According to the fire department's protocol, Scott and Frank could not administer anti-fever medications either. Seeing the absurdity of the situation, I said that I had some ibuprofen in my shoulder bag and that I could give it to Jose Luis. This was not in anybody's protocols, but there were no objections. I located two red Advil caplets and handed them over to the agent who glanced at them briefly and gave the medications to the boy. Jose Luis put the pills inside the pocket of his pants and thanked us. We walked back to the ambulance in silence. Public assist, medic two is available. Scott notified the dispatch. I had been gone for a week and Tanji told me that I had missed several more runs for injured migrants. We sat talking outside of Erivaka's only coffee shop, shielded from the sun by Aleppo pines that grow tall in the desert with a few other trees there. Border Patrol found him walking on Erivaka Sasabe Road, Tanji said about her last call. His sneakers had no sole. That's how far he walked. She continued. Saturday we got got called out again for another UDA, a 24-year-old male, another rhabdo. That's what kills them ultimately out here in the desert, severe dehydration. They, the Border Patrol, were at the very edge of my response area, Highway 286, milepost 23. I, had, I only go to milepost 24, so that's almost 12 miles from the junction of Erivaka Sasabe Road and State Route 286. It's a 30, 35 minute response from here to there. They kept calling. You have ALS today? Yes. What's your ETA? And then I knew he was bad off. But there is nothing I can do when they are that severely dehydrated other than give them fluids. Benji has many stories like this. The hottest I've ever seen anybody out here was 106 degrees. I didn't even think that was viable with life. It's hypothermia for sure. When the cooked temperature is this high, people don't sweat anymore. They usually take a cardigan confused and may have seizures. 104 degrees is the cutoff for making a formal diagnosis of a heat stroke in a human being. If sustained, it leads to organ failure and brain damage. It's death by slow roasting. Luis Alberto Urrea described the process in his account of Mexican migrants who were abandoned by a, their coyote and spent more than four days in temperatures reaching 115 degrees Fahrenheit lost and wandering in the desert southeast of Yuma in 2001. Proteins are peeling of your dying muscles. Chunks of cooked meat are falling out of your organs to clog your other organs. The system closes down in a series. Your kidneys, your bladder, your heart, they jam shut, stop, your brain sparks, out, you're gone. In that incident, 14 died. 11 were treated for severe dehydration and kidney damage. Chances of survival in the desert are measured in degrees Fahrenheit. In mid-June 2015, the thermometer inside a vehicle in Green Valley showed 124 degrees Fahrenheit. Once on a hot day like that, an Erivaka resident saw three migrants being loaded into a truck in the parking lot next to the library. Two squeezed in the front seat with a driver, the lucky ones, she told me. And one climbed into a large toolbox in the bed of the truck. A hot day. I don't know how far they were going or if they made it, she said. Years ago, when Nogales firefighters pointed an infrared heat sensor toward the front passenger seat of a Ford Mustang, it read 156 degrees. The temperature inside the trailer of a commercial truck, similar to the one the Border Patrol stopped on State Route 82 to find 91 undocumented migrants only days earlier, was 140 degrees. High temperatures strand lifeline and life net helicopters on the ground. It's thermodynamics. 
Intense heat decreases air density, which reduces thrust and lift required for helicopters to take off. With flying out of the question, on the hottest days, rescues from the canyons proceed on foot and may take hours. We descended down the escalator in silence, aware that we were entering a tomb. Over 300 emergency responders lost their lives here on a September morning, nearly 17 years ago. We read some of their names inscribed in the dark granite panels surrounding two reflecting pools that filled the void left by the collapsed towers. The events of 9-11 put firefighters on the front lines of the US war on terror, which changed the meaning of emergency. Captain Lopez, Alex, Bojo, and Angel witnessed how they transformed the border in Nogales. But until this cold and windy day in the spring of 2017, they had not set foot on ground zero. Wrapped in scarves they rarely needed in the desert, the four came to pay respect to the brothers who never returned from that tragic call. At an exhibit deep inside 9-11 Memorial Museum, a recording of the dispatcher's voice directing a long list of ladder and engine companies to the World Trade Center plays over and over again. In the same room, the chirping pass device sends chills to those who know that this alarm means the firefighter has not moved for 30 seconds. Many of those who died were crushed by the falling towers, several of their dusty helmets displayed in the cases behind glass. My companions paused to examine the twisted steel columns that held the two skyscrapers and the mangled body of Ladder Company 3, one of several fire trucks that bear the marks of destruction. But they did not even stop at the part of the exhibit that presents the political narrative, from the development of Al-Qaeda to the US government's response after the attacks as those who do the manual labor of rescue, they were attracted to the material texture of violence, not its discursive renderings in the national story of terror and counter-terror, even if that story can bury them alive. Pensive and somber, we stood inside America's gaping wound less than a week after CBP solicited proposals to design President Trump's signature campaign promise, the big, beautiful wall. Eight 30-foot-tall prototypes were unveiled about a year ago, um, tested, and then they left be. But this bizarre spectacle, or pageant, hints to the weaponization of terrain well underway in the region, where both the built environment and the natural topography are already used to enable and facilitate violence. The present fence separating Ambos Nogales, comprised of concrete and rebar-filled steel tubes, meets most of the desired specifications for the new barrier. And we rarely see the wounded. Mutilated bodies are made invisible. Some vanish in the desert and turn up years later as bone fragments reassembled in forensic labs. Others are picked up by ambulances and rushed to hospitals where doctors attend to their fractures and replenish their dehydrated bodies with fluids before ice locks them up in detention centers. People who have been hurt by the wall live in the shadows of public spaces with a renal failure or a permanent limp, bound to a wheelchair or missing a finger. The numbers of those injured by the wall don't exist. No, injure, no agency would be proud to make such figures known. Rescue obscures the politics of wounding. For emergency responders, trauma is routine, a result of energy transfer when a body collides with a surface. Accidents are programmed into the built and natural environment. The mechanism of injury establishes causation between the types of forces involved and specific ways they damage the body. Ordinarily, it matters little who unleashes those forces. Presence or absence of intentionality has no effect on treatment. Emergency responders follow the law, not question it. They avoid politics, even though their refusal to take sides is inevitably political. But they are not blind. They see the rocks sticking out of cement along the border wall. Whether they blame the immigration policy or the people who disobey it, they know a human being won't survive without water in three-digit temperatures for long. They work at the threshold of the state, where it both wounds and cares. Legal exceptions allow the government to operate on what may seem like contradictory principles. Extra legal punishment for trespass, followed by legally mandated provision of aid. But in fact, sovereign power relies on the complementarity of these impulses. Tactical infrastructure simultaneously produces victims and marks them as criminals, erasing the Border Patrol's responsibility for wounding. 
It allows disguising state violence in the form of accidents. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, and the first one is when somebody is injured by the wall, at what point does, uh, does ICE come in, and at what point can ICE come in to deport that person? And the second is, um, as an anthropologist, um, why did you make, why and how did you make the decision to become an emergency responder yourself instead of just going and interviewing people in a journalistic way. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so ICE really comes in very into the picture very late. What happens is uh, the person is taken to the hospital. Sometimes it's in Tucson, which means it's an hour, sometimes two hours uh, drive only 25 minutes by helicopter. The Border Patrol, uh, in some departments, if the department is collaborating with the Border Patrol, is following the ambulance because they take the patient into custody and they are taken to a hospital that has a lockdown unit, the same way they take uh, other people uh, who are arrested. Uh, and uh, once, they are, once they receive treatment, whether it's a surgery or any other kinds of observations, then, uh, then it is when the ice comes in. So it, it, can be, it can be a month, it can be the next day, but, but they are not in the picture immediately. Uh, it's the Border Patrol that's immediately in the picture. Uh, as for my involvement in, as in being emergency responder, I, was, um, I became an EMT, a paramedic, and wildland firefighter well before I started this project. Um, actually uh, began volunteering right here in Cambridge a long time ago, and, uh, and then did this primarily in Fro Florida. So I was more attracted to this project or interested in this problem because I was an emergency responder rather than vice versa. Do they see themselves as heroes? <clears throat> I'm really fascinated by like, the phenomenon of heroism in police and firefighting forces. So. Do they see themselves as heroes in a way, or is there kind of like a pageantry of heroism in, in the town and on either side of the town? I would say that there is some of that feeling of uh, heroism among um, emergency responders, especially firefighters, not necessarily EMS personnel. But it's less pronounced on the U.S.-Mexico border. Most of these uh, fire departments are, which are pegged to the international boundary, are even south of the checkpoints, checkpoints that the Border Patrol also operates within a 100-mile radius of the border. And most of them are Mexican-Americans. A lot of them were born in Mexico or have dual citizenship or dual na nationality, so they they have received a lot of training post 9-11 and have identified with this state, um, but they are also going through a lot of discrimination in training. They, they are not completely accepted because of their ethnicity, because they are, although this is the US side of the border, it's sort of as the government is treating it as if it was Mexico in many ways, and that's really felt among the emergency responders to Tanji, whom I was reading about later. She works in a primarily Anglo uh, department, which is much different than these than Nogales, where um, it's mostly Mexican. Ninety-five percent of residents in Nogales, Arizona, are Mexican origin. Do you think it's possible to build a wall that at least cuts down on the danger to a lot of this? Could you make it soft? I mean, could you have some kind of, you know, something if, they, if you want someone falls? Because, I mean, you know, I do believe in some form of protection, but obviously I'm concerned about, you know, what you're bringing to light. Actually, the it's, it's a very interesting question because in the documents that I was looking at, um, the discussions of how to design a different uh, type of border fence, the factor of injuries comes up, and they, the the for, it, before the border patrol, uh, the, before the Customs and Border Protection, there was an agency called INS, Immigration and Naturalization Services, 
that were uh, in charge of immigration in the region, and they, the the former commissioner, said how how this border that they had creates a lot of injuries. So we need a different one. The problem is that um, the 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 border wall is a wrong answer to very important issues that this country and a lot of countries are dealing with. Um, it does not solve any of the problems it is built for. I recognize that it's probably impossible to eliminate um, national jurisdictions because borders is the ink in which our global politics are drawn today. But what's wrong, the, 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 the good type of border would be between Massachusetts and New Hampshire. You can have different laws, but there is no need to, to have uh, this mechanism of injury. The, the changing design, all of it has done is just produce different types of trauma. It has not deterred people. It has either pushed them to go around or over. It has increased the revenues of organized crime in Mexico because they are controlling these more sophisticated routes of crossing. So it is just counterproductive. I was curious uh, to hear a little bit about the relationship between the border patrols, um, the men and women in the border patrol and the emergency responders. Are they, um, yeah, it, you know, uh, uh, especially the way you put it so beautifully that the, their, uh, the the people you're working with and talking about are at the threshold of care and security and, and kind of deterring but also caring and so as the people who carry out those works, the border patrol and the emergency um, uh, workers, what kind of kind of social relations or interactions do they have? So border patrol agents are not local to the area. They are rotated, and some of them come from Montana or Idaho or elsewhere and speak no Spanish. Um, there is there is a, a big uh, call for more uh, Spanish-speaking border patrol agents to be on duty, but it's not necessarily um, happening. And they are so they're not really part of the community. There is a lot of. Um, resistance even by some business owners to serve border patrol agents in their coffee shops or in their restaurants. So they're not part of the local community the same way as emergency responders are. They do have a good working relationship because they meet at on scenes of emergencies and sometimes these rescues happen in very remote desert areas where you have to carry somebody who fell down a hill for, for like three miles out of a a, a rugged canyon, so manpower is important, and the border patrol is the most uh, available. Uh, in, well, they have most manpower in the area, so they have been helping uh, in in these situations. But there is always a lot of tension. A lot of these uh, uh, Spanish-speaking Mexican firefighters are being profiled when they go through the checkpoints. They are questioned. Their credentials are questioned. Um, so. So they have a working relationship, but there is only only that because they are part of the same government. Just between municipal and federal, there is there is a gap. I was curious about um, funding when it comes to the local emergency departments down there, because you know, opposed to the border patrol, which has you know the funding of the United States government, uh, depending on the jurisdiction, do you find that there? somewhat underfunded, underprepared for the, the amount of cases that they're dealing with? Yes, and that's, um, that was one of the reasons that I was first drawn attention to this project. I saw an article somewhere that said that uh, fire departments who have ambulances in southern Arizona are overburdened by calls to help injured border crossers. And if, if the, in some of these small communities, they only have one ambulance, and if that ambulance just makes rounds between the border patrol station and um, and the hospital. There is no more available care to people who are having strokes, right, um, or overdoses. And so those the fire departments are supported by citizen taxpayers, and their 
how big they are really depends on how big the communities are. So some of these are un, like Erivak or, or Sonoita are unincorporated communities. Um, and they have maybe three or 400 taxpaying citizens, which is very, very little. So they, they, the only way they get reimbursed for providing care to unauthorized migrants, it used to be until 2008 that they could, they could submit um, a form for reimbursement through Medicare Section 1011. But those funds have been exhausted. So now if they want to get some compensation for the care, because these, uh, the injured border crossers usually don't have insurance, they, uh, they send the bill to the Border Patrol. But the Border Patrol then has to take the injured migrant into custody, which makes provision of uh, hospital care contingent on the arrest of these people. And it blurs the lines of providing medical care and uh, policing, which ACLU uh, is looking into. But in that case, the, the departments can send the bill to the Border Patrol and they get reimbursed, usually only like a 25%, not, not the whole cost. So cost is a big, uh, a big problem in small rural communities. So this may sound um, frivolous, but I'm, I'm thinking about how awfully difficult this work is, and I'm wondering if there's any trauma treatment that is provided for the emergency medical people who are day after day dealing with these horrific injuries to often very young children. Yes. Um, there's nothing really specific to these fire departments, but a lot of fire departments around the country have uh, these critical um, de-stressing, de uh, I forgot even how they are called, um, sessions after especially hard calls. These are usually involving very small children, um, but nothing really related to migration. It, it's, it, these are communities where other things happen. The, there are bad fires and terrible traffic accidents, and more emo emergency responders are often more affected by by those calls um, as opposed to somebody who falls off the border fence but is an adult. But this part of the profession that it's um, it's the the PTSD comes weeks, months, years later after seeing so many injuries. So it's not always immediate. One is, uh, I think you have two identities. Uh, one is a, a scholar and the other uh, and the other is an emergency responder. And uh, I'm wondering what's the difference uh, when you approaching things that happen around the border uh, with two different identities. Uh, that's the first question, and the second one is, um, I know uh, many Mexican, man, many uh, border crossers, they cross the border because they can't make a living in Mexico. Their need can't be covered, so, um, and the death, even death couldn't uh, stop them. So what do you think, um, uh, how, can, how can we uh, cover their needs um, and uh, do not do such dangerous things? to cross the border? Um, I'll take the first question first. It's a little easier. <laughs> um, so the, the way scholars and emergency responders approach the world are quite different. Uh, because as an emergency responder, you try to, you, you sort of have this tunnel vision of treating an emergency, right? And as a scholar, you need that uh, distance to reflect. When I was um, at the border, my time was basically divided. So I had, I was volunteering in the Nogales Suburban Fire Department and at the Migrant Aid Center in Nogales, Sonora, across the border. And there I was as an emergency responder. But then other days I was doing interviews and I was uh, doing participant observation in other fire departments. Because it would be, um, it, one, when I was in my skin, my clothes, in my uniform as an emergency responder, I couldn't take out my notebook and write what's going on. You were, it's just too immediate. So 
it was it happened simultaneously over the years I was there, but it was not at the same hour or even the same day often. As to your second question, um, well, a lot of people, so the, the demographics have shifted significantly. If uh, a decade, um, two decades ago, most of the people who were uh, crossing the border illegally were coming from Mexico, now it's no longer the case. Most of the people are coming, I think, numerically, the last, uh, last statistics I saw were from Guatemala, uh, El Salvador, Honduras, and, and Mexico. And these now more people who are coming come as family units. So these are women, they're coming with children, there are older people, there are a lot of people who have been deported from the United States and have no life in Mexico and they're trying to get back. So it, it has really shifted. There can, <laughs> there's a lot of things that, um, that can be done, but it all requires a very long-term commitment because the reason the people are leaving, it's not just poverty, although poverty is a big uh, issue and that's related to the trade liberalization in the 1990s that destroyed a lot of local livelihoods and subsistence farming. Uh, they are fleeing violence in urban areas, some of which has been created through uh, U.S. interventions. They are fleeing uh, political instability and impunity. Uh, so there, there, is, there are a lot of things that need to be done from uh, justice, uh, strengthening of the justice uh, systems in those countries um, to revising the immigration system that we have in this country as well. It's very hard to, to see Mexico or Central America separately from the United States. The, a lot of these issues have been intertwined for decades, um, and the solutions lie there as well as here. Um, I was wondering, because um, I imagine there's a lot of fear with finding someone at the border, whether you're injured or not, you might think it, it's a border patrol, like you never know, you don't speak the language, it's a stranger. What is the protocol usually when you approach someone and they are refusing to be treated because they think you might be, you know, deporting them, basically, I guess? Um, so the people that I've seen that were in, in very worse conditions um, actually wanted to be found. They didn't, they no longer cared whether it's the Border Patrol or the fire department, they, they, they saw them as the only like way to save their lives. They had been lost in the desert for too long. Uh, but there are people who are in somewhat better conditions uh, who refuse treatment, and uh, that's it. Um, then it depends on the dynamics of the call. If, if there is an injured person, you can refuse treatment from civilian uh, ambulance or a fire department, you just sign a refusal. But in many of these situations, the Border Patrol agents are the first ones who find people, either in the desert or they find them uh, by the border fence. So in that case, it's no longer the question of treatment. Uh, they will take you into this Border Patrol station and process you for detention. And it's up to you whether you take the treatment and go to the hospital or you just stay with the Border Patrol. But you have. You don't have freedom in that sense. So it really depends what agencies are there when you're interacting with them. Um, the humanitarian organizations who work in the area, and there are quite a few, there are two San Samaritans, there are no more deaths. Uh, they, uh, they respect people who even if they have a very serious injury, one woman had a collapsed lung, I think, from a puncture wound and she didn't want to go to the hospital, but they don't take a person, their protocols don't allow you to take the person to the hospital without their consent. So the these medical volunteers uh, or humanitarian volunteers try to convince the person to go. And the same with emergency responders, there are people who live south of the checkpoint who have been living there for years and they, let's say their kid gets sick and the only hospital that is more than just like an urgent care center is you have to pass the checkpoint on the highway to go there, which means that the parents can be arrested and deported. But if the kid needs um, more serious care, they'll, they'll, they'll basically 
have to go. But it, it comes to the, to the paramedic on the ambulance to convince them to go because they can refuse if the illness is not considered uh, serious enough to risk being uh, detained. Um, one of the things you mentioned earlier is how some, on some areas of the border, the, there's mostly Anglo uh, agents and other, you know, there's different makeups. And one of the other interesting things that you said is how, you know, even in these immediate situations, there's so many protocols that determine who gets to do what. And I was wondering if because of those different makeups, if there's effectively different treatments in different areas of the borders by people trying to subvert rules or find ways to work around. Um, yes, that that that's true. Um, in uh, in some of these departments that are more like in Nogales or Rio Rico, uh, bigger departments, but also more um, dominated by uh, Mexican nationals uh, among their personnel, they uh, they usually don't. They, they don't have a rule, for example, to always call the border patrol if they suspect a patient to be an unauthorized migrant. Whereas in these small communities like Sonoita or Erivaca, which are primarily uh, Anglo uh, speakers, Anglo uh, Americans, as they are called in the region, um, they, they sometimes it's the um, it's not it's not a law. Nothing in the U.S. laws tells emergency responders that they have to call the border patrol if they suspect the patient is somebody who is in this country illegally. There is no such law. But then it depends on the fire chief of that specific department. And in these smaller communities where resources are so scarce and where taxpayers who are primarily Anglo ranchers um, care about where the money goes and they don't want to drive their fire departments into um, uh, bankruptcy. Uh, those fire chiefs uh, make it a rule that all the emergency responders in there, under their supervision, have to call the border patrol, have to get the patient taken into custody before they provide care. Now again, there are some emergency responders even in these departments who don't do that because again, it's not really a hard and a written rule and it's, it depends on what your morality tells you to do. You mentioned there were area agreements between communities across the border. Um, are they, I just wanted to know what your perspective was on the legality of those um, and sort of as a follow-up, the, whether the Trump administration's presence has sort of affected um, or sort of disrupted that communication of resources across the border? So I didn't really focus on that too much today, but that's that's true. There is uh, these these agreements that they exist on the municipal level between uh, towns, uh, somewhat on uh, county and state level, uh, and on the federal. But on the federal level, the agency that's been promoting all that has been the Environmental Protection Agency. They have a border twenty. They, there was a Border 2012 program, now it's a Border 2020 program that, provi that provides training and gives resources to emergency responders in Mexico and in the U.S. to work together, and they create those um, response protocols. But then again, since it is the Department of Homeland Security and the Customs and Border Protection that regulates the movement of people, it's not. It's easy to provide training and it's easier to give resources. It's much more difficult to let people cross the border to actually provide aid. So the there are act, there are real problems. For example, Americans cannot in most municipalities cannot send the fire trucks across the borderline into Mexico because the insurance wouldn't cover the costs if something happened to them in Mexico. Uh, whereas the Mexican firefighters are sometimes not allowed uh, to enter into the U.S. if they don't have uh, a border crossing card, like a visa or something like that. So there is um, there is uh, some uh, sort of discrepancies between different agencies and what they allow to do, but there is really no cooperation in terms of medical care. Medical care is contingent on parole. so. You can come to the border, if you are in Mexico, you come to the border, and if you are in a really bad medical condition, the port director, the director of the port of entry where you are asking for parole, 
can give you humanitarian parole, which will allow an American ambulance to come pick you up and take you to the hospital. And sometimes you don't need a visa for that. Uh, it, it's, re it's, a, it's a discretionary thing, uh, but it's not, it's on a case by case basis and there is no, no protocols for that. Uh, thank you, sad, very sad, but I like the fact that you picked individual cases because we become immune to numbers when you follow one case, like thing. At the Carr Center for Human Rights, the expert on human trafficking, says the first responders anywhere in the world, be the tsunami, etc., are traffickers. And I know from India, one child gets abandoned in every rail station every day. I know this NGO type thing. But then they get deposited somewhere. They don't like to deposit the child. They were, that's the only alternative. So my question is on the note. When I went to Quarter, everybody knew who the drug was. Lords were, everybody knew what the traffickers were, all the knowledge is known. Okay? And yet we get stuck on whether you can give this kid one ibuprofen or not. He just he, what would it take to get these jokers together and say, hey look, none of us are trying to do anything wrong, but can't we just solve simple stuff? What kind of leader would it take to just say, you, 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 sit down here, figure this out? that's the Kafkaesque nature of bureaucracy, that it seems everyone is just following the rules, and those rules make no sense. Thank you very much. <laughs>